this story. I realize it doesn't necessarily have to be a bedtime story. I like to watch these during the day sometimes. Also, I think I might start filming these during the day a lot more because it's easier that way. I did just get a job and today is Sunday and my first day is going to be Tuesday, so I don't have very long until I'm going to be working, but they're not very long shifts. I know what I'm doing and it's good pay, so it's going to be ideal, but I am going to be pre-filming these as often as I can, so let's get right into it. This is getting so good, this book. Oh my gosh. There was a woman I once knew. She was locked out and I helped her. She saw one of my cards. I used to scatter them behind me like breadcrumbs. She called and I got there as fast as I could. It was Thanksgiving and no one had to say that neither of us had any place to go. The lock sprung open under my touch. Maybe she thought it was the sign of a different kind of talent. Inside, a lingering smell of fried onions, a poster of Matisse, or maybe Monet. No, Modigliani. I've never seen that before. <laughs> Ma Modigliani. I remember now because it was a naked woman, and to flatter her, I said, Is it you? It had been a long time since I'd been with a woman. I could smell the grease on my hands and the smell of my armpits. She invited me to sit down and cooked us a meal. I excused myself to comb my hair and try to wash myself in the bathroom. When I came out, she was standing in her underwear in the dark. There was a neon sign across the street, and it cast a blue shadow on her legs. I wanted to tell her that it was okay if she didn't want to look at my face. A few months later, she called me again. She asked me to make a copy of her key. I was happy for her, that she wouldn't be alone anymore. It's not that I felt sorry for myself, but I wanted to say to her, it would be easier if you just asked him, the one who the key is for, to take it to the hardware store. And yet, I made two copies. One I gave to her, and one I kept. For a long time, I carried it in my pocket, just to pretend. One day it struck me that I could let myself in anywhere. I never thought about it before. I was an immigrant. It took a long time to get over the fear that they'd send me back. I lived in fear of making a mistake. Once I missed six trains because I couldn't figure out how to ask for a ticket. Another man might have just gone on board. But not a Jew from Poland who's afraid that if he even so much as forgets to flush the toilet, he'll get deported. I tried to keep my head down. I locked and unlocked, and that's what I did. For picking a lock where I came from, I was a thief. But here in America, I was a professional. With time, I became more comfortable. Here and there, I added a little flourish to my work. A half twist at the end that lacked purpose, but added a certain sophistication. I stopped being nervous and became shy instead. On every lock I installed, I inscribed my initials. A signature, very small, above the keyway. It didn't matter that no one would ever notice. It was enough that I knew. I kept track of all the locks I'd inscribed with a map of the city folded and refolded so many times that certain streets had rubbed off in the creases. One evening, I went to see a movie. Before the main picture, they showed a reel about Houdini. This was a man who could slip out of a straitjacket while buried underground. They'd put him in a chest locked with chains, drop it in the water, and how he'd pop. They showed how he did exercises and timed himself. He would practice over and over until he got it down to a matter of seconds. From then on, I took an even greater pride in my work. I'd bring the most difficult locks home and time myself. Then I'd cut the time in half and practice until I got there. I'd keep at it until I couldn't feel my fingers. I was laying in bed, dreaming up more and more difficult challenges when it dawned on me. If I could pick the lock to a stranger's apartment, why couldn't I pick the lock to Gosar's Bailey's? Or the public library? Or Woolworth's? Hypothetically speaking, what was stopping me from picking the lock to Carnegie Hall? My thoughts raced while my body tingled with excitement. All I would do was let myself in and then let myself back out. Perhaps leave a small signature. I planned for weeks. I staked out the premises. There was no stone I left unturned. Suffice to say, I did it. Through the backstage door on 56th Street in the early hours of the morning, it took me 103 seconds. At home, the same lock only took me 48, but it was cold out and my fingers were heavy. The great Arthur Rubenstein was scheduled to play that night. The piano was set up alone on the stage, a glossy black Steinway grand. I stepped out from behind the curtains. I could just make out the endless row of seats in the glow of the exit signs. 
I sat down on the bench and pushed down a pedal with the tip of my shoe. I didn't dare lay a finger on the keys. When I looked up, she was standing there, plain as day, a girl of 15, her hair in a braid, not five feet from me. She lifted her violin, the one her brother had brought her from Vilna, and lowered her chin to meet it. I tried to say her name, but it lodged in my throat. Besides, I knew she couldn't hear me. She raised her bow. I heard the opening notes of the Dvorak. Her eyes were closed. The music spilled from her fingers. She played it flawlessly, as she'd never played it in life. When the last note faded, she was gone. My claps echoed in the empty auditorium. I stopped and the silence thundered in my ears. I took one last look out at the empty theater. Then I hurried out the way I came. I never did it again. I'd proven it to myself, and that was enough. From time to time, I'd find myself passing the entrance of a certain private club. I won't name names, but I'd think to myself, Shalom, Shinettes, here's a Jew you can't keep out. But after that night, I never pushed my luck again. If they threw me in jail, they'd find out the truth. I'm no Houdini. And yet, in my loneliness, it comforts me to think that the world's doors, however closed, are never truly locked to me. Such was the comfort I groped for, standing in the pouring rain outside the library while strangers hurried past. After all, wasn't this the real reason my cousin had taught me the trade? He knew I couldn't stay invisible forever. Show me a Jew that survives, he once said as I watched a lock give way in his hands, and I'll show you a magician. I stood on the street and let the rain trickle down my neck. I squeezed my eyes shut. Door after door after door after door after door after door swung open. After the library, after the nothing of the incredible, fantastic adventures of frankly toothless girl wonder, I went home. I took off my coat and hung it to dry, put the water on to boil. Behind me, someone cleared his throat. I nearly jumped out of my skin, but it was only Bruno sitting in the dark. What are you trying to do? Give me a conniption, I yelped, turning on the light. The pages of the book I wrote when I was a boy were scattered on the floor. Oh no, I said. It's not what you. He didn't give me a chance. Not bad, he said. Not how I would have chosen to describe her, but what can I say? That's your business. Look, I said. You don't need to explain, he said. It's a good book. I like the writing. Aside from the bits you stole. Very inventive. If we're talking in purely literary terms, it took me a moment, and then I realized the difference. He was speaking to me in Yiddish. In purely literary terms, what's not to like? Anyway, I'd always wondered what you were working on. Now, after all these years, I know. But I wondered what you were working on. I said, remembering a lifetime ago, when we were both twenty and wanted to be writers. He shrugged like only Bruno can. The same as you. The same of course the same. A book about her. A book about her, Bruno said. He looked away, out the window. Then I saw he was holding the photograph in his lap. The one of her and me in front of the tree on which she'd never known I'd carved our initials. A plus L. You can barely see them, but they're there. He said. She was good at keeping secrets. It came back to me then. That day, sixty years ago, when I'd left her house in tears and caught sight of him standing against a tree holding a notebook, waiting to go to her after I'd gone. A few months earlier, we'd been the closest of friends. We'd stay up half the night with a couple of other boys, smoking and arguing about books. And yet, by the time I caught sight of him that afternoon, we were no longer friends. We weren't even talking. I walked right past him as if he weren't there. Just one question, Bruno said now. Sixty years later, I always wanted to know. What? He coughed. Then he looked up at me. Did she tell you you were a better writer than I? No. I lied. And then I told him the truth. No one had to tell me. There was a long silence. <sighs> it's strange. I always thought. He broke off. What? I said. I thought we were fighting for something more than her love, he said. Now it was my turn to look out the window. What is more than her love? I asked. We sat inside.
silence. I lied, Bruno said. I have another question. What is it? Why are you still standing here like a fool? What do you mean? Your book, he said. What about it? Go get it back. I knelt on the floor and began to gather up the pages. Not this one. Which one? Oy vey, Bruno said, slapping his forehead. Do I have to tell you everything? A slow smile spread on my lips. Three hundred and one, said Bruno. He shrugged and looked away, but I thought I saw him smile. It's not nothing. We're starting a new chapter now. This one's called Flood. And it's starting to list things right off the bat. So, number one. How to make a fire without matches. I did a search on the internet for Alma Mariminsky. I thought someone might have written about her, or that I might find information about her life. I typed in her name and pressed return, but all that came up was a list of immigrants who'd arrived in New York City in 1891. Mendel Mariminsky and a list of Holocaust victims recorded at Yad Vashem, Adam Mariminsky, Fanny, Nasham, Zelik, Herschel, Bluma, Ida, but to my relief, because I didn't want to lose her before I'd even begun to look, no Alma. Number two, all the time my brother saves my life. Uncle Julian came to stay with us. He was in New York for as long as it took him to do the final research for a book he'd been writing for five years on the sculptor and painter Alberto Giacometti. Aunt Frances stayed behind in London to take care of the dog. Uncle Julian slept in Bert's bed. Bert slept in mine, and I slept on the floor in my 100% down sleeping bag. Even though a real expert wouldn't need one, since in emergency conditions, she could just kill some birds and stuff their feathers under her clothing for warmth. Sometimes, at night, I would hear my brother talking in his sleep. Half phrases, nothing I could make out, except for one. When he spoke so loudly, I thought he was awake. Don't step there, he said. What? I said, sitting up. It's too deep, he muttered, and turned his face to the wall. Number three, but why? One Saturday, Bert and I went up with Uncle Julian to the Museum of Modern Arts. Bert insisted on paying for himself from his lemonade profits. We wandered around while Uncle Julian went to talk to a curator upstairs. Bert asked one of the security guards how many water fountains there were in the building. Five. He made weird video game noises until I told him to be quiet. Then he counted the number of people with exposed tattoos. Eight. We stood in front of a painting of a bunch of people collapsed on the floor. Why are they lying there like that? He asked. Someone killed them, I said. Even though I didn't really know why they were lying there or if there were even people. I went to look at another painting across the room. Bert followed me. But why did someone kill them? He asked. Because they needed money and robbed a house, I said, and got on the escalator going down. On the subway home, Bert touched my shoulder. But why did they need the money? Number four, lost at sea. What makes you think this Alma in History of Love is a real person? Misha asked. We were sitting on the beach behind his apartment building with our feet buried in the sand, eating Miss Slavsky's roast beef and horseradish sandwiches. A, I said. A what? A, real person. Okay, Misha said. That's the question. Of course she's real. But how do you know? Because there's only one way to explain why Litvinoff, who wrote the book, didn't give her a Spanish name like everyone else. Why? He couldn't. Why not? Don't you see? I said. He could change every detail, but he couldn't change her. But why? His obtuseness frustrated me. Because he was in love with her. I said. Because to him, she was the only thing that was real. Misha chewed a bite of roast beef. I'm thinking you watch too many movies, he said. But I knew I was right. It didn't take a genius to read the history of love and guess that much. Number five. The things I want to say get stuck in my mouth. We walked down the boardwalk toward Coney Island. It was boiling hot, and a trickle of sweat dripped down Misha's temple. When we passed some old people playing cards, Misha greeted them. A wrinkled old man wearing a tiny bathing suit waved back. They think you're my girlfriend, Misha announced. Just then, my toe caught, and I tripped. I felt my face get hot, and I thought, I am the most awkward person on earth. Well, I'm not, I said which wasn't what I wanted to say. I looked away, pretending to take interest in a kid 
dragging a blow-up shark toward the water's edge. I know, Misha said, but they don't. He turned 15, grown almost four inches, and started to shave the dark hairs above his lip. When we went into the ocean, I watched his body as he dove into the waves, and it gave me a feeling in my stomach that wasn't an ache, but something different. I bet you a hundred dollars she's listed, I said. There was no part of me that actually believed this, but it was all I could think of to change the subject. Number six, looking for someone who most likely doesn't exist. I'm looking for a number for Alma Mariminsky, I said. M-E-R-E-M-I-N-S-K-I. What bureau? The woman said. I don't know, I said. There was a pause and I heard the clicking of keys. Misha watched a girl in a turquoise bikini rollerblade past. The woman on the phone was saying something. Excuse me, I said. I said I have an A. Mariminsky on 147th in the Bronx, she said. Hold for the number. I scrolled it on my hand. Misha walked over. So, do you have a quarter? I asked. It was silly, but I'd already gone so far. He raised his eyebrows and reached into the pocket of his shorts. I dialed the number written on my palm. A man answered. Is Alma there? I asked. Oh, he said. I'm looking for Alma Mariminsky. There's no Alma here, he told me. You got the wrong number. This is Artie, he said, and hung up. We walked back to Misha's apartment. I went to the bathroom, which smelled of his sister's perfume and was crowded with his father's grayish underwear drying on a line. When I came out, Misha was shirtless in his room, reading a book in Russian. I waited on his bed while he took a shower, flipping through the pages of Cyrillic. I could hear the water falling and the song he was singing, but not the words. When I lay on his pillow, it smelled of him. Number seven, if things go on like this, when Misha was young, his family went to their dasha every summer, and he and his father would take the nuts down from the attic and try to catch the migrating butterflies that filled the air. The old house was filled with his grandmother's china that really came from China, and the framed butterflies three generations of Slavskis had caught as boys. Over time, their scales fell away, and if you ran barefoot through the house, the china would rattle and your feet would pick up wing dust. A few months back, the night before his 15th birthday, I had decided to make Misha a card with a butterfly on it. I went online for a picture of a Russian butterfly, but instead I found an article reporting that most butterfly species had declined in numbers over the last two decades, and that their extinction rate was about 10,000 times higher than it should be. It also said that an average of 74 species of insects, plants, and animals become extinct every day. Based on these and other frightening statistics, the article reported, scientists believe that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction in the history of life on Earth. Almost a quarter of the world's mammals face extinction within 30 years. One out of eight species of birds will soon be extinct. 90% of the world's largest fish have disappeared in the last half century. I did a search on mass extinction. The last mass extinction happened about 65 million years ago, when an asteroid probably collided with our planet, killing all the dinosaurs and about half of the marine animals. Before that was the Triassic extinction, also caused by an asteroid or possibly volcanoes, which wiped out up to 95% of the species. And before that was the late Devonian extinction. The current mass extinction will be the quickest in Earth's 4.5 billion year history and unlike those other extinctions, isn't caused by natural events, but by the ignorance of human beings. If things go on like this, half of all species on Earth will be gone in a hundred years. For this reason, I did not put any butterflies on Misha's card. Number eight, interglacial. The same February, my mother got the letter asking her to translate the history of love. 
there for today. Thank you so much for watching. This is seriously coming together more and more. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you did enjoy it. And subscribe to my channel if you aren't already subscribed. It depends on the video, but a lot of people who watch these aren't subscribed to my channel, so subscribe, dang it. It will help my channel grow. <laughs> and then I'll have more confidence, and then I'll post even more. Okay. If you have any ideas or any other ASMR videos you'd like from me, let me know in the comments. Hit that notification bell if you want to be notified when I come out with the next part of this. And the next parts, because it's seriously, it's all gonna unfold pretty soon here. And it's, it's really, it's just now starting to unfold, truly. As always, I will have a playlist in the pinned comment below of all of these videos in order so you can start from the very beginning this book and know exactly what's going on. So make sure to check those out. That would be really freaking awesome of you. Whatever you're doing, have a good day, good night, good evening. Bye guys. Motion detecting at front door. So glad that doesn't freak me out anymore. It just annoys me. Because it's never true. There's nobody ever there. Gosh. Okay. <laughs>